Men of Iron, Chapter 10 Perhaps there is nothing more delightful in the romance of boyhood than the finding of some secret hiding place, whether a body may creep away from the bustle of the world's life, to nestle in quietness for an hour or two. More especially is such delightful if it happens that, by peeping from out from one may look down upon the bustling matters of busy everyday life. While one lies snugly hidden away, unseen by any, as though one were in some strange, invisible world of one's own. Such a hiding place as would have filled the heart of almost any boy with sweet delight, Miles and Guskin found one summer afternoon. They called it their eyrie, and the name suited well for the roasting place of the young hawks that rested in its windy stillness, looking down upon the shifting castle life in the courts below. Behind the north stable, a great long rambling building, thick-walled and black with age, lay an upper older part of the castle, then that people by the cl better class of life, a cluster of great thick walls, rudely but strongly built, now the dwelling place of stable boys and cattle, swine and poultry. From one part of these ancient walls, a fronting an inner castle, a court of the castle, arose a tall, circular, heavy buttressed tower considerably higher than the other buildings, and so mantled with the dense growth of aged ivy as to stand a shaft of solid green. Above its crumbling crown circled hundreds of pigeons, white and pied, clapping and clattering in noisy flight through the sunny air. Several windows, some closed with shutters, peeped here and there from out of the leaves, and near the top of the pile was a row of arched openings, as though a balcony or an airy gallery. Miles had more than once felt an idle curiosity about this tower, and one day, as he and Guskin sat together, he pointed his finger and said, What is that place? That, answered Guskin, looking over his shoulder, that they call Brutus Tower, for they did say that Brutus built it when he came to Britain. I believe not the tale myself. Nevertheless, it is marvelously ancient, and old Robin the Fletcher tells me that there are stairways built in the wall and passageways, and a maze wherein a body may get lost if he knows not the way, and never see the blessed light of the day again. Mary, said Miles, those are strange sayings. Who lives there now? Uh, no one lives there, said Guskin. Excepting some of the stable boys, and that half-witted goose herd who flung stones at us yesterday when we mocked him down in the paddock, he and his wife and those others dwell in the vaults beneath, like rabbits. No one else has lived there since Earl Robert's day which was a hundred years ago. The story goes that Earl Robert's brother, or stepbrother, was murdered there, and some men say by the Earl himself. Since that day, it has been tight shut. Miles stared at the tower for a while in silence. It is a strange-seeming place from without, he said at last, and it may be even more strange inside. Have you ever been within, Francis? Nay, said Guskin. Did I not say it has been fast locked since Earl Robert's day? By our lady, said Miles, if I had lived here in this place as long as ye, I would have been within it before this. <laughs> Be shoo me, said Guskin, but I have never thought of such a matter. He turned and looked at the tall crown rising into the warm sunlight with new interest, for the thought of entering it smacked pleasantly of adventure. How would ye set about getting within, said he presently. Why, look, said Miles, see ye not yonder hole in the ivy branches? I think there is a window at that place, if I mistake not. It is within reach of the stable eaves. A person might climb up by the faggot pile to the roof of the hen house, and then by the long stable to the north stable, and so to that hole. Guskin looked thoughtfully at the Brutus Tower, and then suddenly inquired, Would ye go there? Aye, said Miles briefly. So be it. Lead ye the way in the venture. I will follow after you, said Guskin. And as Miles had said, the climbing from roof to roof was a matter easy enough for an active pair of lads like themselves. But when, by and by, they reached the wall of the tower itself, they found the hidden window much higher from the roof than they had judged from below, perhaps ten or twelve feet, and it was, besides, beyond the eaves and out of their reach. Miles looked up and looked down. Above was the bushy thickness of the ivy, the branches as thick as a woman's wrist, knotted and intertwined. Below was the stone pavement of a narrow inner court between two stable beings. I think I can climb to yonder place, said he. You'll break your neck, said Guskin hastily. Nay, quoth Miles, I think not. 
but break or make, we get not there without trying, so here goes for the venture. Your harebrained knave as ever drew breath, as lip of life, said Guskin, and will cause me to come to grief some of these fine days. Nevertheless, if ye be jack fool and lead the way, go, and I will be tom fool and follow. If your neck is worth so little, mine is worth no more. It was indeed a perilous climb, but that special providence which guards reckless lads before them. So, by climbing from one knotted, clanging stem to another, they were presently seated snugly in the ivied niche in the window. It was barred from within by a crumbling shutter. The rusty fastenings, after some little effort upon the part of the two, gave away and entered the narrow opening. They found themselves in a small triangular passageway, from which a steep flight of stone steps led down through a hollow in the massive wall to the room below. At the bottom of the steps was a heavy oaken door, which stood ajar, hanging upon a single rusty hinge, and from the room within a dull gray light glimmered faintly. Miles pushed the door further open. It creaked and grated horribly on its rusty hinge, and as an instant answer to the discordant shriek came a faint piping squeaking, a rustling, and a pattering of soft footsteps. The ghosts, cried Guskin in a quavering whisper, and for a moment Miles felt the chill of goose flesh creep up and down his spine. But the next moment he laughed. Nay, said he, they are rats. Look at yonder fellow, Francis. He is big as Mother Joan's kitten. Uh, give me that stone. He flung it at the rat, and it flew clattering across the floor. There was another pattering rustle of hundreds of feet, and then a breathless silence. The boys stood looking around them, and a strange enough sight it was. The room was a perfect circle of about twenty feet across, and was piled high with an indistinguishable mass of lumber, rude tables, rude chairs, ancient chests, bits and remnants of cloth, of sacking and leather. Old helmets and pieces of armor of a bygone time, broken spears and pole-axes, pots and pans and kitchenware of all sorts and kinds. A straight beam of sunlight fell through a broken shutter like a bar of gold falling upon the floor in a long streak of dazzling light that illuminated the whole room with a yellow glow. "'By Our Lady,' said Guskin at last, in a hushed voice, "'here is Father Time's garret for sure. Did ye ever see the like, Miles? Look at yonder ableist. Sure Brutus himself used such a one.' "'Nay,' said Miles, "'but look at this saddle. Mary here be a rat's nest in it.' Clouds of dust rose as they rummaged among the moldering mass, setting them coughing and sneezing. Now and then a great gray rat would shoot out beneath their very feet and disappear, like a sudden shadow, into some hole or cranny in the wall. Come, said Miles at last, brushing the dust from his jacket. If we dare here longer, we will have a chance to see no other sights. The sun is falling low. An arched stairway upon the opposite side of the room from which they had entered wound upward through the wall, the stone steps being lighted by narrow slits of windows cut through the massive masonry. Above the room they had just left was another of the same shape and size, but with an oak floor, sagging and rising into hollows and hills where the joists had rotted away beneath. It was bare and empty, and not even a rat was to be seen. Above was another room, above that another, all the passages and stairways which connected the one story with the other being built on the wall, which were solid, and was perhaps fifteen feet thick. From the third floor, a straight flight of steps led upward to a closed door from the other side by which shone the dazzling brightness of sunlight, and whence came a strange noise, a soft wrestling, a melodious murmur. The boys put their shoulder against the door, which was fashioned, when pushed with might and main, once, twice, and then suddenly the lock gave way, and out they pitched headlong into a blaze of sunlight, a deafening clapping and uproar sounding in their ears and scores of pigeons suddenly disturbed rose in stormy flight. They sat up and looked around them in silent wonder. They were in a bower of leafy green. It was the top story of the tower, the roof which had crumbled and toppled in, leaving it open to the sky, with only here and there a slanting beam or two supporting a portion of the tiled roof, affording shelter for the nests of the pigeons crowded closely together. Over everything the ivy had grown in a mantling sheet, a network of shimmering green through which the sunlight fell flickering. "'This passes wonder,' said Guskin, at last breaking the silence. "'Aye,' said Miles, "'I did never see the like in all my life.' "'Then, look yonder's a room behind. Let us see what it is, Francis.' 
Entering an arched doorway, the two found themselves in a beautiful little vaulted chapel, about 18 feet long and 12 or 15 wide. It comprised the crown of one of the massive buttresses, and from it opened the row of arched windows, which would be seen from below through the green shimmering of the ivy leaves. The boys pushed aside the trailing trundles and looked out and down. The whole castle lay spread below them, with the busy people unconsciously intent upon the matters of their daily work. They could see the gardener, with bowed back, patiently working among the flowers in the garden, the stable boys grooming the horses, a bevy of ladies in the privy garden playing at shuttlecock with battle doors of wood, a group of gentlemen walking up and down in front of the earl's house. They could see the household servants hurrying hither and thither, two little scullions at fisticuffs, and a kitchen girl standing in the doorway scratching her head. It was like a puppet show of real life, each acting unconsciously a part in the play. The cool wind came in through the rustling leaves and fanned their cheeks, hot with the climb up the winding stairway. "'We will call it all airy,' said Guskin, "'and here we will be the hawks that live here.' And that was how it got its name. The next day Miles had the armorer make him a score of large spikes, which he and Guskin drove between the ivy branches and into the cement of the wall, and so made a safe passageway by which to wit the window niche in the wall.' 